They're frightened. They know the government is filled with lying, deceitful. Uh, we, we don't even have words for this government of ours. Many of you have words, but we're not going to use them here because then I'll go into the hate that I'm trying to avoid, the rage, the anger, the righteous indignation. I, I've got to stay away from it. It makes you too brittle. It doesn't leave you flexible enough to fight them. And what's coming over the next year, a uh, year that's left of this monster, is unimaginable. You think you've seen it all, you're mistaken, because I know what they do in the last three months. It's the, the sin qua non of everything that they've done before that, magnified by three. What Bush did to us in the last three months of his reign was unimaginable. I was the only one in radio who saw it coming. I called him a, what did I call him, a socialist or something like, a fiscal socialist. It was August of the last year of Bush's reign. I had always been a little queasy about him. I never liked him. I thought he was a double talker. I thought he was part of the deceitful establishment. It was proven when all the talk show hosts who were conservative were invited to lunch with him except me. That was okay. I accepted that. I'm used to it as an independent, not Republican. I, I, I accepted that. didn't matter. Now, what happened was, as I said, he's a fiscal socialist lookout, and he busted the economy out in the last three months as you well know, and gave us Obama as a result. And they created Obama. Make no mistake about it. The Republicans wanted Obama. They carried the football of the seat for eight straight years, and they knew they couldn't carry it for another four. So they gave you Obama for another eight, figuring they'll play the game back and forth, the two-card Monty. See? So now we've had a Democrat for eight years. It's time for Republican. And they're shocked that it may be an independent nationalist like Trump. And they're doing everything they can to shaft the American people. But, but I want to talk about what I talked about. Could Handel's Messiah have been written at a time like this? Impossible. It's impossible. Nobody would listen to it. First of all, the mind that, that wrote this, that conceived it, doesn't even exist anymore. If it does, I don't know where it is. It's evaporated. It's been atomized by our government media complex, mainly by the media and drugs. So you still have this great music. God knows if it's permitted to be played. And uh, I know this is a little off point. It's okay. We're around holiday time. And I'm talking about inspiring people through uh, love, hope, and humor. The positives. We don't want to go with the anger, rage, false righteous indignation or the hatred that is raging in America right now, primarily because the country is being stolen from us by the illegitimate vermin on the left and I, I don't really want to go there I don't want to get angry and I know where this is gonna lead I'll give you a news story related to what I'm talking about and it creates a conflict in me yesterday a leader of the Yazidi people spoke before Congress and he said because we are not Muslims we are being burned alive Chaldean Christians and Yazidi leaders described the genocide of their people at the hands of the Muslims in the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria to members of Congress Wednesday at a hearing on assistant vict assisting victims of ISIS. And he said, because we are not Muslims and because our path is the path of peace, we are being burned alive. That's amazing to listen to this. They're talking about the desperate plight of the Yazidis from uh, Kurdistan who are being targeted by the Muslims and ISIS because they're considered heretics. And because they're members of a religion that believe in peace, they're being slaughtered, mainly because the Muslim administration, excuse me, the Muslim-friendly slash Muslim-oriented administration gives them a blind eye, will not give them weapons, will not give them air support, will not defend them. I don't want to eat my heart out over what's going on in this country because we know we have an enemy within that's on the other side of reality, the reality of most of the people. But the main point here is that here are people who practice peace. Their path is that of peace. Peace. They're being burned alive by the Muslims who claim to be uh, Muslims in ISIS. So you say, well, Michael, that kind of goes against your entire frame of argument today. You're saying that you want to inspire through love, hope, and humor. Well, look what's happening to these Yazidis who are following their religious teachings of peace. They're being burned alive by the Muslims who are following their religious teachings of, well, you can fill in the blank. I know they're not Muslims, according to Obama, and I know it's politically uh, just so incorrect to say they're not Muslim. Well, what are they then? 
Islamic State. Why do you think all of a sudden this government has suddenly start, started to use the Arabic phrase for them called Daesh? Because it doesn't have the word Islam in it. This is the brainwashing. This is the grotesqueness of this double-talking administration. They won't even say it's Muslim now. They want to call it Daesh. Kerry uses that, that fork-tongue liar. But again, I don't want to go there because, again, I'm going to go some, to somewhere I don't want to be in. I don't want to go there. So how do you fight without becoming hateful? How do, how do you fight? How do you even maintain your sanity without maintaining hatred? That's the real question. You know, that's the real question everyone faces. How do you face such utter lies and hatred and a threat to our survival and those of us who have grandchildren? We look ahead and we shake our heads and we say, th this has to be stopped. We don't have a year left under this charlatan in the White House and the liars in the press. We don't have a year left. And many of us are at the point of no return with our desire to do something. Many of you can't even sleep anymore. Can't even sleep. Many of you are so agitated you can't sleep. Because you know what this man is doing to this country and the world. You know it. It's upside down. It's an Alice in Wonderland world through the looking glass. Everything he says is the opposite of reality. Everything he does is the opposite of what should be done. And the American people are screaming out for salvation. Now, I'm not running for office, don't get me wrong. I made that decision a long time ago. When I first started in radio, I thought maybe I should be a politician. I toyed with the idea, but I don't have the nature for it at all. I, I could never survive the campaign trail. My, I have too hot a temper, number one. I don't like to cater to people. Number two, I don't want to raise money. Number three, I would get physically violent towards the media. I can't, I tell you the truth, I have no patience for these lying slime. And so I can't be around them. I, I've worked with them. I know what they do. I know how they've tried to destroy my career over these years. I'd rather do what I do this way. But how do you inspire people through love, hope, and humor? All right, so I talk about the dog, and many of you love Teddy. And I told you there'll be a Teddy-oriented uh, book with 100 pictures of him, <laughs> him and me and some of them. It's mainly him and me. Today I'm very angry at him because he peed on, my, on the floor again when I turned my back. I got so mad at him. It was five minutes before the show, two minutes, and he snuck in the room that he goes in and he did it. I got so angry I had to be on my hands and knees with a, a spray and a piece of paper two minutes before a national show. And as I was cleaning up this dog's mess and angry at him, I got so mad at him for sneaking around and doing that, I started to laugh. And I said, you know, I remember there were teachings way back in the 70s from collateral friends of mine who were Buddhists, who used to go to some of these Buddhist meetings where there were some very, very wise teachers. And one of the Buddhist teachers, the, every, all of the, the whites would go there and sit on there with their legs crossed in the lotus position, looking for some great inspiration from these, these uh, Tibetan Buddhists or Zen Buddhists. And sometimes they get these really wacky statements such as, take the garbage out if you want to know what it is to be a Buddhist. Because if you don't take your own garbage out, you can't be a good, you can't be an ascended master. And they didn't even understand what he was saying to them. What he was saying to them is don't get so disconnected from reality that you don't even know what you are. In other words, don't leave your body. And if that means taking your own garbage out, then do it. There's a story related to that one of Einstein. I love this story. Great, great physicist Einstein. Uh, at this point, he was quite famous, and he had, he had agreed to an audience with some man, I don't know who it was, was allowed to see him. The man came in, Einstein was sitting behind his desk, and he said, Herr Einstein, Herr Einstein, I realize what your theory of relativity means. It means that nothing is real. Nothing is real. So as the story goes, Einstein stood up slowly, walked over to him and slapped him in the face. And he said, is that real? Now, you see what I'm saying to you. Don't get so disconnected from reality with your philosophy that you forget the danger you put yourself in whether it means slipping on a sidewalk because your head is in the clouds or bicycling through an intersection and killing a civilian because you think you're so great, as occurs too often in San Francisco where there are no laws against these bicycle terrorists. Or, in fact, in many other ways, you can get so disconnected from your body that you have no reality, which leads us back again to how do I inspire you in an age where those who hate us want to kill us and, in fact, are killing us as evidenced in San Bernardino last week.
The government failed at every level. We learned today that Obama told the NSC and the FBI to downplay the terrorist angle of San Bernardino. That's only one part of it. There's another part to it. DHS, Homeland Security, that clown, had shut down the investigation into Farouk and Malik to protect the civil liberties of potential terrorists. That, to me, my friends, tells us everything we need to know about Jay Johnson of Homeland Security. I've known from the beginning this would happen, and this is just the beginning. So where does it lead us again? Outrage, anger, what's going to happen with your outrage and anger? And it leads me to this point. Here are these poor Yazidi people practicing a religion of peace, being burned alive by Muslims in, in, in the Islamic State. So where does that leave us? Should we just turn the other cheek as they burn us at the stake? No, you all know that's not going to happen in America. I look at books that I'm reading right now. I'm reading books now on the Jewish Soviet partisans who fought the Nazis. These were ordinary men and women. They were, they're ordinary lawyers, doctors, uh, butcher, baker, candlestick maker, homemaker. Nobody would have expected that in a few years under Hitler when they invaded the Ukraine and other parts of Europe, that Jews would be rounded up and killed and that some of them would have to escape into the woods, join the partisans and become murderers to survive. How could a little humble tailor, for example, learn to pick up a gun and kill Germans and stick a knife into their heart, seeing another man's face in front of his face until the man was dead in front of his eyes so he could get that Nazi's gun and survive another day and put bread on the table for his wife shivering to death in the woods? How did he learn to do it? The agony, the destruction of the human spirit. Some survived. How did some of the Jews survive that? Not all Jews went into the gas chamber saying, Oy vey. Not you have the image. You and many of you have the image of Jews as weaklings. I would hope that by now you understand Israel was not founded by Jewish weaklings. And why Israel will last long after the hateful people around them are long dust. Israel will last forever. And the haters will be dead long after. Trust me on that one. Trust me on that one. Despite all its flaws, Israel is God's chosen land. And that's why the Christians support Israel. It's not to convert the Jews, as the cynical liberal Jews will tell you. So you look at stories like this and you say to yourself, well, what would I have been? Would I have been able to go from who I am to picking up a weapon and fighting with them in the woods? I don't know. Would I? We don't really know, by the way, until you're put into that situation. But all my life, I have... Walk between powerlessness and power. Does that strike a chord with you? Can one man listening to this show tell me that you're different than me? Have you not walked your whole life between a feeling of powerlessness and power? See what I'm saying to you? How is it possible to know who you would be? Which one would you have been? The one who would have gone to your death peacefully, crying? Or would you have fought back? Now, many of you say, well, I would have fought back. Well, good, that's a good feeling. But there's a big difference between thinking that you would have fought back and having fought back, and no one really knows. And so now it comes to today. We're facing a minor kind of war in the United States of America today. It's a war of ideas. The ideas that are coming at us from Barack Hussein Obama and Hillary Clinton, the press, the academic institutions, is nothing short of totalitarianism, mind control at every turn snuffing out Christianity, snuffing out individuality, snuffing out maleness itself. This is the message coming from these people. And many of you are on the front lines of the battle in your daily lives. And you know it and I know it, but you can't do anything about it. Again, we circle back to what I asked you at the beginning of this hour. And the hour is flying by as it always does. When I am inspired, as I am today, when I speak about inspiration, when I go to the deeper side of myself, the time is, is timeless. When the show is moving slowly, and I look at the clock, and it's only segment two, and I say, I don't know how I'm going to get through the next hour. I know it's a bad show. But like a day like today, when it's already 46, 47 minutes into the first hour of the show, and I haven't even begun to warm up yet, I haven't taken one call yet. I know the reason why. And so do you, and it brings us back to the, to the question I asked you. How would you use this power that I currently have 
as a broadcaster, a national.